Hello, everyone. All right. I have the tripod up this time. Welcome. I have the ocean. We're pretty far away, but uh, hopefully it'll be a little dynamic. The sun is way up there. So welcome back to mysticism. We're gonna read Evelyn Underhill's book. Um, mysticism, the nature and develop, studying the nature and development of spiritual consciousness. And so I always wanted to find a safe way you know, not to go off the path because I'd gone off the path way too many times before, not on purpose, but just because, you know. Now, don't take this as a liberty, okay? But Meister Eckhart, Meister Eckhart, the German mystic from like the 13 or 1400s, said um, something like, it's better to make a mistake than to not to do anything, you know? I heard someone else say it uh, yesterday in a video or the day before. She said, um, when you take action, it's like you're putting dynamite to the, uh, your faith. You're activating your faith. You know, you can say, I trust in God, but then it's like, you know, they say if someone's walking over the Grand Canyon on a tightrope, you know, and it's Jesus, right? And you say, I trust you. And then he walks over the Grand Canyon with a wheelbarrow, right? And then he's like, now get in. You know, how many of us would actually get in? This is what our life of faith is about. And so I encourage you to just not be just, you know, someone who says, oh yeah, I want to be mystic and I want to study all these cool things, right? It's like, no mysticism. The only objective is to have union with divine love, not anything else. If you have anything else, then that becomes an idol, right? Okay, so I'm going to start because I finally was able to make this into a podcast. I thought it was before, now it is. So I want to be talking. Just, you know, start already because they don't all have this view of the ocean. But you're welcome to come over here. If you're on the podcast, find my YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Cheryl Meyer, M-E-I-E-R. It ought to be the same on, on the podcast. It's on the podcast says it anyway all right welcome okay so I'm gonna go over the paragraph where we left off we're on um, we're in the section of the book called the mystic way you can start here trust that you were meant to start here I always say that and then um, after this you can go start at the beginning of the playlist and just listen and listen and listen you know and you can listen at um, one and a half times speed or so if you'd like, if, uh, unless you, anyway, whatever. Go on a long road trip and you've got 40 hours. <laughs> okay. You can pray for the people here too. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your inner room and shut the door. You know, this is how, why I have this ring, to remind me. And your father who hears you in secret will, will, will listen to what you're saying, you know. But ask for God's will to be done, you know. That's always, anyway. Um, okay. We must, says Dionysius the Areopagite, contemplate things divine by our whole self standing out of our whole selves becoming holy of God. This is the passive union of contemplation, a temporary condition in which the subject receives a double conviction of ineffable happiness and ultimate reality. He may try to translate this conviction into something said or something seen, but in the end, he will be found to confess that he can tell nothing save by implication. You know, we try to find, oh, I've been a psychologist 20 years, but it doesn't matter about that. I love, I love, doing my best to practice the presence of divine love. And so sometimes I'll make a comment and sometimes I'm stopped. <laughs> um, anyway, but um, 
we're, uh, if you go back, if you think of Psalm 91, he that, he or she, you know, it's, it's he or she. In, in Greek, it's auto, which is he or she or it. But in Hebrew, I don't know. Um, anyway, the one that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, the, the eternal one of the eternal one. When we're up here, you know, it says we have been raised with Christ and we're seated at the right hand. And I welcome all religions. I'm just quoting St. Paul here for a second to understand mystic things. He says, you're seated at the right hand of God in heaven and heaven is our home. And so we're just pilgrims here. And so we can understand we have full illumination up in heaven in that secret place. And when you dwell there and let everything else go, let nothing else hang on with you, you know, the, the sin that so easily entangles us. And sin is just to miss the mark, to miss the mark of perfect consciousness. If you hold on to anything that's less than God, then it will pull you down when you're trying to go up the hill to the next level, you know. And even if you're trying to go to the next level because of your own egotism, that pulls you down. It's a, you know, and so God, it's by God's grace. And the word grace actually is charis. Look at the first time it's used in the New Testament. I'll let you guys do that. It has something to do with your character. And I heard someone, I heard a bishop this morning actually say, you know, faith, faith is not just like one day. I say, oh, I put my faith in Jesus, hallelujah. You know, you, it's like, it's like if you said to your spouse, okay, I want to marry you. And then, you know, as soon as anything, any problem comes or they look ugly one day or whatever, you know, their own baggage comes up or your baggage gets triggered and you're like, ah, you know, forget it. You know, you're, um, you're not acting according to your commitment. The commitment is because we're loved first, loved first. And then we live a life of faith is because Jesus says, abide in me. We're abiding in that tree and we and so the love of divine love is flowing through us. It will produce good fruit. But if it's been producing bad fruit, then you watch out. You know, if you want divine union, and that's what all of our souls crave, but, you know, you get to determine that. You get to see that, uh, see for yourself. If you want that and you're asking God for that, then um, don't be surprised when he roots everything else out that you've been storing down there. You know, it's like the worst and the best of spring cleaning. Anyway, just give you a little heads up. If you're on that path right now, then you're, you're in the right place, right? We're in the desert. Look at all these flowers in the desert. With man, it's impossible, but with God, this is possible, right? It's possible. We had like record rains in California this year, I think. We did. <sighs> wow, the ocean is just so expansive right now. I wish I could zoom in. Anyway, all right. Okay. So, oh, that's what I was saying, is when you're up in this heavenly place, you can understand these things, like when you're in a meditation, when you come out and you try to explain what happens, it's just like this. It's hard to find words because words are just approximations, you know. If we, if someone said the word Santa Claus, you know, Saint Nicholas, right? We all have different ideas of that, but you can't just say, oh, it's Santa Claus and someone that's never heard of Saint Nicholas or Father Christmas or Christmas. They won't know what all that encompasses, you know. It's just like that's how words are limiting. If I just say the word God, that's why I use divine love because it's this eternal oneness. Uh, I've heard the absolute infinite beingness, right? Those are, anyway, because so many people have misused the word God. Okay. It's just choosing. You know, you can do this with me or not. Choosing to be here in this moment and let go of everything else. Whatever problems we thought we had, just let them go. So you can give this time to God, to divine love, you know. Ask divine love to, to bless this hour for you or this 45 minutes. I only have 45 minutes this time. Maybe we'll get to the end of the chapter. So sometimes we close that way anyway. I don't know yet. I didn't look ahead. So that Jesus, when he went into the temple, he opened the scroll of Isaiah and he says, 
for the Lord, the Eternal One, has anointed me. I'm anointed. God has anointed me with the Holy Spirit, right? Or the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's how it goes. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And God has sent me and anointed me. I am anointed. Um, and it says to frame, proclaim the good news to the poor, right? And all of us in our egotism are poor, no matter how rich we are in this world. I think rich we think we are in our personality selves, you know? That's why fame doesn't mean anything. It's just a temporary thing like, like this stick, right? It's just like that. That can roll down the mountain and it was here for that moment. So, and to proclaim the good news to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted, all right? So what does that mean? If Jesus always did the will of divine love, the will of his Father, always, and he said he did this, and he's not lying, and he's not crazy, then he's telling the truth. And to heal means to make whole. He wants your, whole, your heart to be whole, made whole. All right, like 11-11. <laughs> That's the one, the one eternal God. And then four, I look at that, not, I don't do numerology or anything. I just look at it like four is stability, like stable ground, like a table, like a house. It's not God four times, but anyway, whatever. I did a live on 11.11 on if you want to go look that up on YouTube. Okay, so he may translate this, so he may, a person, he or she may try to translate this conviction into something said or something seen, but in the end, he will be found to confess that he can tell nothing save by implication. The essential fact is that he was there, as the essential fact for the returning exile is neither landscape nor language, but the homely spirit of place. All right, now C.S. Lewis reveals all of this in, in his Narnia books. I recommend reading those, right? And he said every book he's ever written, he's quoting either directly or indirectly George MacDonald. And that's why I have, and he said he's never taught, he's never read anyone closer to the Holy Spirit of God besides George MacDonald, you know? And George MacDonald is the one that says, don't teach your kids you have a soul, teach them you are a soul and you have a body. But I have The Princess and the Goblin and The Princess and the Cardi. I've read those. Maybe I'll turn those into podcasts too. <sighs> I can't do everything at once, right? It's just me. <laughs> Team God and me. I'm not trying to complain. I love it. I love it. Um, and so, um, and I have a lot of people encourage me online. <laughs> um, oh, but I was thinking in C.S. Lewis's book, Lucy says, I know I went to Narnia, but I don't know how. You know, she says that in the 1970s cartoon. You could look that up too, it's awesome. And so, um, you've been to that place, but when they went back to the wardrobe, they tried to get in and the door was closed. And so they thought she was making it up. But the professor was like, if she was making it up, wouldn't she have stayed in there for like four hours? She made up a four hour story. Why would she make herself look like an idiot? Why would we make ourselves look like idiots by saying the things we say, you know, unless that's what we've experienced, you know? Don't worry about looking like an idiot in this world. Lewis Carroll says that, you know, the best ones are <laughs> a little mad. But not, uh, we have sound minds. Like, don't worry about that. We still have sound minds. <sighs> For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. All right, so if you start having not a sound mind, then ask God if you've fallen off the path and you're going on some spiritual path for egotism. Ask, you know, and you'll be corrected right quick. <sighs> All right, that was sort of the foundation for this, I think. To see and to have seen that vision, says Plantius, in one of his finest passages, is reason no longer. It is more than reason, before reason and after reason, as also is the vision which is seen. And perhaps we should not here speak of sight, for that which is seen, if we must need speak of seer and seen. 
as two and not one. It is not discerned by the seer, nor perceived by him as a second thing, ellipsis. Therefore, this vision is hard to tell of, for how can a man describe as other than himself that which he, that, okay, that which, when he discerned it, seemed not other, but one with himself, indeed. And I'm getting a, an image of a washing machine. If you're in the washing machine, you know, you're describing your experience within it, and now you came out of it, and you're trying to describe what it was like to be in it, but you experienced it as in it. You didn't experience it as outside of it, so you're trying to explain that, you know? See? Look at what happens, because I did laundry this morning. <laughs> didn't want to. <laughs> That's our flesh. It never wants to do the, the, you know, the ordinary faithfulness. That's what this is about. You don't have to do extraordinary things. Do the ordinary things over and over and over again, you know? I encourage you. Encourage. I was reading Blessed Theophylact and and I kept right underlining every time he said, Jesus was saying, take courage. Jesus was saying, take courage. I wanted every word to say that, you know, because courage, I was taught in 1998, right? I remember being taught this in Montreal. It's a father thing. It's to infuse with courage. What Moms can encourage as well, but dad, you know, dads are like, the good lion, like Aslan, you know, he goes to Lucy and he says, courage to your heart, you know, when they're in the darkest place. I'll start crying if I think about it. I've read that book so many times in, in really dark places of my own. That's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And the first one with Lucy was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Okay, therefore, this vision is hard to tell of, for how can a man describe as other than himself that which he discerned it, seemed not other, but one with himself in, indeed. Roy's Brooks, Roy's Broek, who continued in the medieval world the best traditions of Neoplatonic mysticism, also describes a condition of supreme insight, a vision of truth, obviously the same as that as at which Plantius hints. Contemplation, he says, places us in a purity and a radiance which is far above our understanding and none can attain to it by knowledge by subtlety or by any exercise but he whom god chooses to unite to himself and to illuminate by himself he and no other can contemplate god but few men attain to this divine contemplation because of our incapacity and of the hiddenness of that light wherein alone we can contemplate and this is why none by his own knowledge or by subtle examination will ever really understand these things. For all wor words and all that one can learn or understand according to the mode of the creatures are foreign to the truth that I've seen and far below it. But he who is united to God and illuminated by this truth, he can understand truth by truth. This final satisfying knowledge of reality, this understanding of truth by truth, is at bottom that which all men desire. The saint's, the saint's thirst for God, the philosopher's passion for the absolute is nothing else than this crying need of the spirit. Variously expressed by the intellect, and by the heart. The guesses of science, the diagrams of metaphysics, the intuitions of artists, all are pressing towards this, right? I use songs to teach, teach about the soul, but they're just pressing towards this. You can't have this unless, I mean, I love how she's saying this, explaining it, unless divine love gives you this grace to, to go here. Um, the diagrams of metaphysics, the intuitions of, all, of artists, all are pressing towards this, yet it is to be found of all in the kingdom of the contemplatives, that, quote, little city set on a hill, which looks so small to those outside its gates. Right? Look. 
There's a city right over there on a hill. Do you see it? I'd zoom in. It looks really small, but I've run over there before. Jesus says, you know, you are the light of the world. And he says, I am the light of the world. But he says that about you. And he says, uh, you know, a city on a hill, can you hide its light? You can't, you know? Don't hide your light. Don't hide it underneath depression and anger and bitterness and complaining and the old lack mentality. You don't need that anymore. You don't need it anymore. I'm not saying don't feel your feelings, but don't believe the lie that you're a victim because God, Jesus said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. So that's us, all right? He's not leaving us high and dry. Uh, the little city set on a hill, which looks so small to those outside its gates. Man's soul, says Hilton, perceiveth full well that there is somewhat above itself that it knoweth not, nor hath not yet, but would have it, and burningly yearneth after it. And that is not else than the sight of Jerusalem outwardly, which is like to a city which is the prophet Ezekiel saw in his vision. He saith that he saw a city upon a hill towards the south, that to his sight, when it was measured, was no more in length and breadth than a reed. That is six cubits and a palm of length. But as soon as he was brought into the city and looked about him, he saw that it was wondrous great, for he saw many halls and chambers, both open and secret. He saw gates and porches without and within, and many more buildings than I now speak of, and that it was in length and breadth, many hundred cubits, and that it seemed a wonder to him that the city was so long and so large within, that seemed so little to his sight when he was without. This city betokeneth the perfect love of God set upon the hill of contemplation, which to the sight of a soul, that without the feeling of it, traveleth in desire towards it, seemeth somewhat, but it seemeth but a little thing, no more than a, a rood, a reed, I think she said, R-O-O-D. That is six cubits and a palm length. But six cubits are understood the perfection of man's work. And by the palm, a little touch of contemplation. Aw, oh, that's awesome. You know, six plus the Sabbath is seven. That's complete, you know. The number of man is six. But anyway, I won't go into that. But interesting. All right. I don't know who's reading this. Oh, Royce Brooks, maybe. Uh, yeah. Uh, is surpassed by six, uh, like as a palm is surpassed by six cubits, but he seeth not within what it is. Yet if he can come within the city of contemplation, then seeth he much more than at first. All right, it's just like Narnia. I didn't know she was gonna go into this. You enter into the wardrobe and you're in a whole other world. You know, C.S. Lewis, just like George MacDonald is, you know, George MacDonald, the princess has to go up and she keeps getting lost when she's going up and she gets, and she um, has to follow an invisible thread in the princess and the goblin. I am crying in that book. It is so profound. It's so deep. It's so moving. Remember, if you guys have been with me, that part that I cried when I heard about St. Francis of Assisi, his, comp his transformation, I'd never heard of that before. There's a part... I think, yeah, in The Princess and the Goblin. Princess and the Goblin, I think. I'm just start bawling my eyes out. It might be in The Princess and the Cur Cur No, it's in The Princess and the Goblin. When he converts, it's just like St. Francis of Assisi. It's, you'll know if you, you have a spiritual heart. You know, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So tender. But so, yes, it's so much bigger when you go in, you know. One of my clients gave me this picture that I have on my desk still from years and years ago and it says even in our world we have something that was bigger inside than it was on the outside and it has a picture of just baby Jesus you know inside a stable like in the animal trough you know the eternal heart of Jesus right okay so anyway all right, so 
So with a touch of contemplation, he seeth well that there is such a thing. That, okay, so, as in, and that's the end of the quote. Royce Brooks, Le ornament de gnosis spiritualis. Spiritualis. Gnosis, is that Latin? I don't know. As in the case of vision, so here, all that we who, without the feeling, travel in desire, and I'm thinking of Pilgrim's Progress too, you can read that. He's on this path, you know, and he's trying to get to the heavenly city. It's about this as well. Can really know concerning contemplation, its value for life, the knowledge it confers, must come from those who have come within the city. You know, we're telling you, like, I'm only, I'm only partially, like, I don't know how much I've been in that city, right? But like St. Teresa of Avila talks about the interior castle and how so many people just stay on the outside porch. They don't even come in and they can call themselves Christians or, or whatever, you know? And it's like, Jesus says, many will call me Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you, you know? You were like, the, there were 10 virgins, five who kept their oil burning, five other virgins, they were religious, you know, they, they were, uh, you know, virgins means like, they tried to keep themselves holy unto God, but they didn't have their oil burning and stuff, you know? Ask God what that is, right? Um, come, okay, so, and knowledge it confers must come from those who have come from within the city. Watch, look on my Twitter, uh, Dr. Cheryl M. I recommend you do this. I really recommend this. This is worth, this is worth your time. It's so beautiful. You'll, you'll cry your eyes out, right? <laughs> In a good way. It, 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 all these things help you open your heart to understand what it was like for Christ to be on the cross. It hurts, but it hurts good because it opens your heart. It makes your heart bigger. But don't take it for vanity's sake or ego, but it's Dr. Cheryl M. It's at D-R-C-H-E-R-Y-L-M. Do a search with at Dr. Cheryl M and comma Raggedy Ann and Andy. And uh, sometimes I do hashtag resource. And I just recently linked it again to the one that works because the old one is out. And you'll see, you know, their whole task is to get their name. It's like the white stone, their God name in the book of Revelation. George MacDonald has a sermon called the, uh, the White Stone. You can look that up too. But And Raggedy Ann is going and um, her heart breaks on the way. But she gets there. But Raggedy Ann... Raggedy Andy went somewhere else. I won't, I won't do a spoiler alert, right? Just, you can watch. And um, it's a sad, it's, I resonated so much with that. A long, long time ago, I found that in 2014, maybe. Or before. It's from 1947 or something, right? Okay. It's that's your whole spiritual path is in that cartoon, that little cartoon. What in effect can they tell us about the knowledge of reality, which they attained in that brief communion with the absolute? They can tell us chiefly what we come to co when we come to collate their evidence, like if that's what she's doing here, right? Evelyn Underhill, I hope I mentioned her. She influenced C.S. Lewis for sure. They corresponded and Tolkien and Charles Williams. I know Charles Williams, I'm thinking Tolkien. Anyway, I love Tolkien so, and they always met Tolkien and Lewis and, and they were part of the Inklings. Anyway, they speak almost, they tell us chiefly when we come to collate their evidence, two apparently contradictory things. They speak almost in the same breath of an exceeding joy, a beatific vision, an intense communion, and a loving sight, and of an exceeding emptiness, a barren desert. Wow, I just said that, right? An unfathomable abyss, a nescience, a, a divine dark. Over and over again, these two pairs of opposites occur in all first-hand descriptions of pure contemplation. Remoteness and intimacy, darkness and light. If you read Brother Lawrence's, read his first two letters and they just explain this. I read it over the weekend and it helped me so much when I was getting discouraged about something. He talks about this and it just reassured me that I was still on the right path, you know? Because we can deceive ourselves. He 
you can pray for me. I always say, if you believe in the eternal one God, divine love, but I don't know if I have to caveat it. God protect me from anything else. There's all these bees over here, like full of bees. They're so pretty. I can hear them buzzing. I didn't know what the buzzing was. Maybe you can hear it. Remoteness and intimacy, darkness and light, bearing in mind that these four groups of symbols all describe the same process seen through a temperament and represent the reaction of that temperament upon absolute reality. We may perhaps by their comparison obtain some faint idea of the indescribable somewhat, with a capital S, right, at which they hint. Now, Brother Lawrence said, this is what was comforting to me, right? He says, sometimes I come to God, to divine love, as my loving father, sometimes as an abject criminal before his feet, you know? And it's just like, oh, you know. And he had such an intimacy with divine love and he still experienced that. So it's reassuring to me. Uh, note first that the emotional accompaniments of his perceptions will always and necessarily be the stuff from which the mystic draws suggestive language by which to hint at his experience of supernal things. His descriptions will always lean to the impressionistic rather than to the scientific side. What we, what the impression is, right? The deep yet dazzling darkness, the unfathomable abyss, the cloud of unknowing, the embrace of the beloved, all represent not the transcendent, but his relation with the transcendent, not an object, object observed, but an overwhelming impression felt by the totality of his being during his communion with a reality, which is one. The R, capital reality, which is one, right? This is free copyright, so I can show all this. Because it was, it was written in 1910, 1911, uh, 1910, published in 1911, I think. It is not fair, however, to regard contemplation on this account as preeminently a feeling state. I'm getting, okay, so I'm just getting the impression This is going to sound weird, but, and this could be from my fear mind. I don't want to discount it though. I'm just getting this impression, like download a couple of these. If you have, if you have the YouTube download, if you know, we get storms and stuff like that. If anything happens, um, you can have a few hours of these to listen to if the internet goes down somewhere where you live. Um, I like doing that. The ones where you can download it legally, you know, you can have it on your, uh, on a few hours or something on your YouTube and then you put it back, you know. Not, I'm not saying to take mine anywhere else. Please don't because um, this is how, uh, you know, a worker is worth her wages. This is how I can make money later on. <laughs> um, so then you'll be taking away from me and my kids. I mean it. So... I appreciate not to do that. Um, I don't know why that was coming to me, but it, okay. But his relation with the transcend, transcendent, not an object observed, but an overwhelming impression felt by the totality of his being during his communion with the reality, which is one. It is not fair, however, to regard contemplation on this account as preeminently a feeling state and hence attribute to it as many modern writers do a merely subjective validity. It is, of course, accompanied, as all humanity's supreme and vital acts are accompanied, by feelings of an exalted kind. And since such emotions are at least abnormal part of it, at least, at the least abnormal part of it, at the least abnormal part of it, they are the part which the subject finds easiest to describe, see? And so look, if all of a sudden there was a double rainbow right here, double rainbow, right? I saw one once and I was freaking out. I put it, I put it on, but I, I follow that guy who saw the double rainbow first. I love that guy. Um, 
if we saw that, right, and we were having the worst day and we just felt like we weren't trusting God and there weren't any promises that was he was keeping, the rainbow is a representation, a representation of his promise to Noah, you know? And so we would feel like that's a double, double presentation of promises kept, promises kept. Like God is like, I am faithful, you know? He's communicating to us. So of course you're going to feel something, you know, if your heart isn't hardened by sin and by, we sear our conscience when we go into sin, you know, God wants us lighthearted as he heals the broken heart by taking away our sin. So we're not hooked into it. So we're not captives to it. We're not slaves to it. That keeps us, keeps that light out. It's like uh, St. John of the Cross talks about in the ascent of Mount Carmel. It's like, shrouded with darkness and there's reptiles everywhere you know just ask god to clean you out <sighs> i love latoya okia has god's washing machine video it's so good i linked to it somewhere so good if you remind me i'll link to it you know i'll find it for us i don't always you know this is this i don't know when this is going to get posted how many anyway um reality which is one it's not fair however okay yeah so it's not just a feeling state you're gonna have exalted feelings but that's why we describe these things sometimes with our feelings these elusive combinations of fear amazement desire and joy are more or less familiar to him him or her the mystic you know she usually when she's talking about the soul she uses she and so this person on the journey she's often using he but him i think meant more back then to, as, as all of us, you know, mankind, uh, humankind. Anyway, the accidents of sensual life have developed them. His language contains words which are capable of suggesting them to other men, like mankind, right? But his total experience transcends mere feeling, just as it transcends mere intellect. Intellect, it is a complete act of perception, inexpressible by these departmental words. And its agent is the whole man the indivisible personality whose powers and nature are only partially hinted at in such words as love, thought, or will. The plane of consciousness, however, the, uh, however, the objective somewhat of which this personality becomes aware in contemplation is not familiar to it, neither is it related to its systems of thought. Man, accustomed to dwell amongst spatial images adapted to the needs of daily life has no language that will fit it at all because when you're in the spiritual realm you can see 360 you know what i mean it's really weird like i i i don't know how much to say of mine but it's kind of like if someone if someone in your dream like gave you a high five but you couldn't see them because you're used to trying to look out of these two eyes and they're behind you but then you all suddenly had a knowing that wait they just gave me a high five did you just give me a high five i i, I had got the impression you had the, now some people will have spiritual sight like artists can go in a room and they could see this landscape once like that one autistic boy d draw the whole landscape like details of New York City and he saw it for like 15 minutes and he could like draw things that were in people's windows in high rises or something, you know, it's so amazing. And so it's like when you have that muscle developed, you know, then you might see things or other people just are given different gifts by God, you know, uh, of hearing of, you know, I, I get songs all the time, but you have to, you have to ask for discernment because you know the the forces of evil can can try to influence you as well through your gifts and they'll try to manipulate manipulate you so you use your gifts for evil instead of for good as well so i'm like i don't recommend that you know because your soul wants to be good you know it does it longs for that that's real love all right that's alignment that's alignment with how you're created you know we're not created to, to do evil that's a perversion of the good it's always a twisting of the good and you're not meant to be twisted you know anyway all right uh earthly emotions provide a parallel which enables the subject to tell us okay wait so person hearing okay men oh. neither is it accustomed to systems of thought Man is accustomed to dwell among spatial images. 
okay, yeah, I was saying that. Adapted to the needs of daily life, has no language that will fit it at all. So a person hearing for the first time some masterpiece of classical music, you know, would have no language in which to describe it objectively, but could only tell us how it made him feel. And I told you guys that I shared that a bunch of videos ago. I was with my friend Charlie Mackesy in his van. He just got an Oscar nomination. I know an Oscar, he won an Oscar. Um, anyway, I, I don't know how long ago, but he won one. But I was in his van, right? We were driving from Yorkshire to London. Hilarious, hilarious, I won't even go into it. But he was playing The Marriage of Figaro. And it was in Italian and I was just so moved and I didn't know and I wrote it down on like, you know, my little, one of my tickets or something, a bus ticket I had or something. La, no La Nozze de Fig Figaro and I looked it up later and it was like, I would sang it before. Tell me what love is, what can it be? What is this bunny yearning in me? What is this burning yearning in me? By day it haunts me, haunts me by night. This tender torment tinged with delight, right? And I didn't know, it was in Italian. I didn't know I could feel it, I could feel it. When I saw, I heard it in English, I think I cried, you know? I was like, Charlie, what is this? You know, oh, I'm not so difficult. He says it with a British accent, I don't, I don't know. That. My friends are like, Charlie, it's Charlie. Anyway, Charlie's on the phone. <laughs> anyway, um, this is one reason why feeling states seemed, uh, seem to preponderate in all descriptions of the mystic act. Earthly emotions provide a parallel which enables the subject to tell us by implication something of that which he felt, but he cannot tell us, for want of standards of comparison, what it was that induced him thus to feel. His best efforts to fit words to this elusive, somewhat generally result in the evaporation alike of its fragrance and of its truth. St. Augustine said of time, he knows what it is until he is asked to define it, right? You know, just like St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless until we find their rest in thee, God, you know? This isn't it, this isn't it, and this isn't it. Oh, I found another thing, that's not it. That's another idol, I made another idol. Oh, you know go back to the drawing board how symbolic and temperamental is all verbal description okay we wouldn't have finished this chapter anyway i was gonna i was gonna start going, wait you, you ought to have read faster but i was and you know no be present with what is it all came for a reason right i'm about to wrap this up how symbolic and temperamental is all the verbal description of mystical activity may be seen by the aspect which con contemplation takes in the music-loving soul of Richard Roll, R-O-L-L-E, -L -L -E, who always found his closest parallels with reality, not in the concepts of intimate union or self-loss in the divine abyss, but in the idea of the soul's particip participation in a supernal harmony, that sweet minstrelsly, minst minstress, minster, of God, in which thought into song is turned. Wow, our thoughts are turned into song. I didn't know she was going to talk about song today. To me, he says, it seems that contemplation is joyful song of God's love taken in mind with the, with sweetness of angels loving. This is jubilation. Jubilation, she loves me again. It's Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> Come on home. That's Cecilia. There's other sad parts in that. But anyway, this is jubilation. Uh, that is the end of perfection, prayer, and high devotion in this life. This is that mirth and mind had ghostly by the lover everlastingly with great voice, outbreaking ellipses, contemplative sweetness, not without full great labor is gotten, and with joy untold it is possessed. Forsooth, it is not man's merit, but God's gift. And yet from the beginning to this day, never might man be ravished in contemplation of love everlasting. But if he before par perfectly all the world's vanity had forsaken, unless before that you've forsaken all of the world's vanity, just like I had said earlier, right? I wish you so much love. I have a meeting and that's why we only have 45 minutes, but it's great. I'm glad. Thank you for being here. Share this and make sure to like, make sure to go back and like all the ones you've seen. <laughs> Much love.